you. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the 14th meeting uh, of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And I remind everyone to switch off your electronic equipment that could interfere with the sound system and uh, also people in the audience too. Uh, welcome everybody uh, and uh, have apologies first of all from Jim Hume and we welcome Alison McInnes as a substitute and ask her if she has any uh, things to declare. Thank you, Convener. There's no relevant declaration to make. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Agenda item one, then, is resource use and the circular economy. And the first item today is for the committee to take evidence on resource use and the circular economy from stakeholders. And I refer members to the paper uh, which uh, we have in preparation. Um, I'm going to ask you to introduce uh, yourself uh, very briefly. Uh, just so that we know who we are and uh, then after that I'll kick off with the first question and there's a number of members have been thinking about it. So starting with Cara. Uh, Cara Hilton, MSP for Dunfermline. Hi, I'm Dustin Benton here from Green Alliance. Good morning, Ian Menzies uh, from Education Scotland. Claudia Beamish, South Scotland MSP and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Gordon McGuinness, Skills Development Scotland. Uh, Ewan Men, Scottish Enterprise. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP. Colin Webster from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. James Curran, SEPA. Nigel Tom, Angus North and Moons, MSP. Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Uh, Ian Gullen from Zero Waste Scotland. Alison McInnes, MSP for North East Scotland. Marnon Wakefield from Dryden Aqua. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. I'm Lucy Chamberlain from the Great Recovery Project at the RSA. I'm Graham Day, I'm the MSP for Angus South. And I'm Rob Gibson, the convener, and then the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Um, we're quite interested in kicking off on a kind of general note. Now, just catch my attention. The sound system is automatic. They'll find you. You don't need to press any buttons. Um, and thinking about the um, paper we've had from the Green Alliance, uh, we're interested in identifying some themes uh, of... Uh, a thematic approach to how Scotland can approach the circular economy and um, how it should be structured and governed uh, so as to meet the challenges that we face. If I can put it in those terms, uh, for those who want to read the Green Alliance's um, academic words, they're at the top of um, page five for members. Um, it says... This analysis was intended to identify sectoral opportunities, but was focused more on identifying the thematic governance-focused challenges that Scotland faces in promoting the circular economy across all sectors. We're quite keen on uh, clear and simple English. Um, and uh, the problem about this issue is that it's a bit academic in those terms, and we want to make it as practical as possible for people. And that's one of the reasons why we're picked as MSPs from five varying backgrounds to try and bring that practicality to bear on the subject. So what themes should we be uh, you know, focusing upon? How should the circular economy be governed? What can be done at the Scotland level? Anyone want to kick off? Just put your hand up. Yes, Dustin. That challenge, uh, and I, I will endeavour to be not too academic. Apologies. Uh, it comes from my background, and uh, you know, you say you work for a think tank, and you expect uh, all this serious wonkery. I guess the, the, what we tried to do is to look at what, what is Scotland as a, as a country, what are its strengths, where are its opportunities, and how might that apply to the circular economy? So I guess there were three things that we noticed that seemed particularly relevant. Uh, one was obviously the scale of Scotland, uh, a relatively small country, and that has benefits and drawbacks. We also looked at Scotland's institutions and looked at how those might differ from, differ from other countries that are trying to take forward um, the circular economy. And I temporarily forgot the third thing we looked at, but it will come back to me. Yes, politics and policy. Uh, and that, we think, makes a big difference. Uh, so just touching on those three uh, very briefly, Looking at um, other countries within the UK, for example, England, uh, about the policy and politics, 
and thinking about energy policy where Scotland has been very successful, one of the things that we saw that was really important was a clear direction given by the Scottish Government, uh, in this case in favour of renewables and other low carbon technologies like CCS. The, that clear direction enabled investment to happen and gave a sense that, uh, of possibility rather than prevarication. On the institutions, uh, we, we noted that um, Scotland has maintained a, a robust range of institutions which could help take technologies out of the lab through the commercialisation process and into the market. And those institutions, having that institutional framework is really important. When we spoke to uh, a suite of investors here in Edinburgh uh, about a month and a half ago, they said to us how important human contact, you know, knowing people, getting interaction with people was. And we think that Scotland's institutions might be able to foster that very effectively. Finally, on scale, and I think this is really important, uh, Scotland is a relatively small economy in the context of you know, China, India, the United States, etc. It doesn't have a lot of material to process in big factories, so that limits the very large-scale reprocessing opportunities. Uh, we're unlikely to see a big aluminium smelter in Scotland, for example. Um, but there are real opportunities in the social connectedness that flows from small scale. So people know each other. You can talk to people. You can get a, a substantial section of the Scottish business community together and talk as people rather than in you know, big plenary sessions. And that human-to-human -human contact, I think, will make a big difference in a circular economy that requires lots of interaction, lots of connection, and lots of discussion across supply chains. Um, James Curran. I think you're right to look at it in those kind of two dimensions at least, maybe more, and the, the, the Scottish Circular Economy Programme, which is jointly run by Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands, Enterprise, SEPA and Zero Waste Scotland, is actually looking at it in two dimensions, which is evidence gathering and engagement. And on the ev evidence ga gathering, again, it's looking at a sector approach and a thematic approach. And under the sector, specific studies is pursuing uh, investigations on sectors such as oil and gas, renewable energy, aerospace, defence, food and drink, and the opportunities in, and, and, and the mechanisms in there for, for creating and developing the circular economy. And then under the thematic uh, approach, it's, it, it, it's um, widely, more, more wide applicable approaches like critical materials to the Scottish economy, fiscal measures, eco-design, types of business models you might look at, um, extending and amplifying producer responsibility and wider regulatory activity, which is a <coughs> sorry, sorry, croaking today, um, particularly an interest of SEPA, obviously, and, and links to the definitions of waste. So, And then on, <coughs> on engagement, <coughs> thank you very much. It's about identifying those opportunities, as, as uh, our colleague said. Um, but I, I think uh, our... our uh, kind of initial analysis would certainly lead us to think that uh, in order to stimulate the circular economy, it, it, it probably needs intervention which is either fiscal in, in terms of subsidies and, and, and uh, other mechanisms for promoting the circular economy or regulation or standard setting. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of work following exactly the kind of lines that you indicated. Okay. Um, anyone else want to come in on that um, at the moment? You and Merns, perhaps? from uh, Ellen MacArthur. Um, yeah. If I can support what James has just been saying, I mean, th we, we, we have been taking a Team Scotland approach, um, and I'm not necessarily convinced we need any new institutions to, to govern how we deliver on the circular economy. I think we've got all of the, or certainly ma most of the, uh, the main delivery organisations who are involved um, in this exercise. So, um, as Dustin has, has, has highlighted, um, Scotland has that small scale, scale. We can make these connections. We can deliver quickly and be agile. Um, so I think you know the, the key issue really going forward is just to clarify what the particular roles are of, of development organisations. Have a strong policy lead from the Scottish Government. Um, CEPA leading on regulation. We've got the enterprise agencies. We've got Skills Development Scotland, Education Scotland. So uh, between the partners, I think we you know we we've got the right right kind of institutions already involved. You and I realise you're from Scottish Enterprise when I read my notes. Uh, I meant that uh, perhaps Colin Webster might want to come in just at the moment, you know, as a, a commentary on this general level. Thank you very much. I think to build on uh, the last two points that we've had, one thing that we learned from, or, or certainly France has learned from trying to instigate a circular economy through Parliament, is that the first thing you need to start with is an informed and collaborative process rather than a sort of legislative first approach, uh, which was the route that they went down. 
Um, uh, and as a result, they, they, they drew some criticism from some of the corporate partners because there wasn't enough of that, that business collaboration that it sounds like uh, through you and, and through James is, is certainly going on in Scotland. And certainly I know from uh, conversations I've had, seems to be the case. Uh, another thing that they found actually was in France that, that you have to be careful not to make the circular economy a subset of, of simply environmental policy or, or waste policy. This needs to be a, a systemic overview of um, how the economy could work. And, and again, I think from the sounds of things from James and Ewan, that, that seems to be the direction that Scotland is taking this into. Okay. Uh, Graham Day wants to come in. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. I, I don't want to expand on this scale issue. Um, two examples I, I, I would put forward, perhaps we could discuss. Uh, as I understand it, the plastic, the plastic bottles, Coke, Fanta bottles, whatever, that we generate in Scotland tend to go to England to a plant there to be recycled to provide the recycled material for the next generation of plastic bottles. I, in my own constituency, um, I have um, an SSE uh, uh, regional centre where they recycle much of the, of the kit that they, they gather, but that's stuck on the, the back of a lorry taken to Aberdeen and shipped across to mainland Europe. What I want to explore it is, are we doing that because we don't have the infrastructure and we could realistically have it in Scotland, or is it the case that we could not proceed on this on a Scotland level and we might have to look at it at a broader UK level or perhaps a European level? In, in practical terms, what can we do as Scotland here? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Specifically on, on plastics, obviously, uh, there are opportunities for us in Scotland for a number of the materials that we are uh, currently collecting, I guess, out of both the household waste stream uh, and the commercial waste stream. And obviously, with the introduction of new regulations on the 1st of January this year, there will be more materials coming out of the waste stream. Uh, and you're, you're right. I mean, the majority, three quarters of the, the household waste that we recycle gets exported out of Scotland. So there's obviously... Uh, in terms of the, the lost benefit to our economy, in terms of reprocessing, remanufacturing that material, it's, it's, it's kind of lost to some extent. Uh, but you're right, but there are opportunities. But I think the, the things that obviously our evidence and our work is, is showing that uh, because Scotland, and it's been highlighted already in terms of Scotland, is, you know, we have to accept it as a small country in terms of the amount of resources we have, uh, it's quite, still quite fragmented how those materials are collected with, with the respect, 32 local authorities and a number of other uh, businesses uh, as well. We really do need to harness that together and work collaboratively uh, with that supply chain. And you know, obviously, hopefully, you'd be glad to know that work is underway, uh, both uh, a joint task force uh, with the Scottish Government and COSLA, uh, looking at this, how the, pub the wider public sector uh, can look at the, the resources they have and really pull them together, I guess, in a, in a simple language to, to make those things happen. Because uh, that is one of the challenges. We're, we're looking at a, a brokerage model. Uh, where local authorities might pool their resources, I guess, together to not only get a better uh, economic price for their materials in terms of uh, scalability as, you, as you, in economies of scale, but more practically use that as feedstock for those opportunities. And that is one of the, one of the challenges that we have in Scotland. Uh, you know, just, if you're trying to land a plastics reprocessing facility in the southeast of England, you can, you can go to 100 authorities and you can get... <laughs> you know, 10, 20 percent of them to sign up. But to get that kind of volume in Scotland, you need all 32 authorities uh, to sign up to some sort of uh, supply chain. So these are challenges. Uh, we are obviously working with uh, local authority colleagues in the wider public sector because it involves everybody to try and make those, uh, these opportunities, you know, land in Scotland. So that is one of the challenges that we have. And it is about investment. And again, we work closely with Scottish Enterprise, so it's not just about the supplies. How can we make the, you know, the funding or the, the support available to those types of facilities here in Scotland. BMD. Yeah, can I come? Just, so to be clear, if we got all 32 local authorities pulling in the same direction here, what's deliverable in Scotland in terms of infrastructure? What could we realistically expect? <laughs> yeah, and, and, I mean, again, I could, write, I could reel off a list of, you know, X number of plastics reprocessing facilities and stuff like that, but it's Getting the materials is one thing, but it's obviously making sure that we've got the right economic conditions for those businesses here in Scotland. And obviously the, the offtake of that material, I mean, plastic bottles is a good example where we do have the likes of uh, obviously milk producers in Scotland and Coca-Cola have a factory uh, in Scotland uh, as well. So th there are people who are looking for this material in Scotland. So you could provide that sort of closed loop circular economy for those specific materials. Uh, but yeah, there is, I mean, 
there's huge opportunities for plastics, there's some opportunities for other materials for the, from the household, there's enormous opportunities in, in terms of some of the, the commercial waste, industrial waste as well, uh, you know, in terms of reprocessing, remanufacturing, looking at our supply chains. And it might mean that it's not all circular in Scotland, that we add value to it here and then export it at a higher value out of Scotland or bring it back in and add value to it before it goes back into supply chain. So there's a pragmatic uh, view of this, but certainly we could, we could add more opportunities in Scotland. But yes, oh, get it, sorry, yeah, the, the answer to the question was yes, if all the local authorities worked together, these opportunities would be easily, more easily realised. Um, is it on the question of scale and that sort of thing? Claudia Beamish and then Nigel Dawn. Thank you. Um, I, I was interested in relation to scale, seeing the Green Alliance evidence about the um, bioeconomy sector and the importance of cross-sector opportunities in Scotland. And I'm wondering if either the Green Alliance or any other of the panel today could comment on how that could be facilitated uh, here in Scotland. Yes, um, Dustin Ben. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the, one of the thing, part of the reason why we put in the bioeconomy example, with, which um, takes in byproducts from the whiskey industry and shows how if you could extract some valuable materials from those byproducts and send them towards both the pharmaceuticals and the salmon farming industry, you would capture a lot more value than we presently capture through either anaerobic digestion or feeding, uh, to, feeding these um, byproducts, some of them, to uh, cattle and um, sheep, I think. Um, forgive me for not having all of the detail on that. Um, I guess just coming back very quickly to the scale question, one thing that Scotland can do is to separate materials more intensively. Um, we know that one of the things that Biffa Polymers has done in the northwest, I believe, uh, has switched from many different types of plastic to feed into its, I think it's 20,000 tonnes per year factory. It's, it's switched to a single polymer type and therefore has made that smaller scale economically feasible. Those are opportunities which could work in Scotland. We know also that very intensive source separation of plastic bottles in Switzerland uh, was key to them having a pure enough plastic stream to be able to send to a reprocessor. Actually in England, this was uh, Boots back uh, about a decade ago, was developing plastic bottle recycling and had to get a very pure stream. So went all the way to Switzerland couldn't source this stuff in the UK. So those are the sorts of opportunities which Scotland might be able to take up. On the, on the cross-sector um, stuff, the idea is that sometimes your material may not be terribly valuable to you. So if you're a... If you're a um, uh, a waste company and you're collecting plastic bottles, the best thing that you might be able to do then is to sell to China and you might achieve around £300 per tonne if you're very good at separating those out. But if you can sell those into a plastics reprocessor, different sector, they can raise the value of that up to about £1,000 per tonne, which is what we see in closed loop London, for example, or eco plastics, both, uh, both in England. Um, the, the making that happen is really a question, I think, for RDAs and uh, technology development bodies. It's about trying to make links. Sorry? RTAs? Uh, regional development agencies, so the likes of Scottish Enterprise or Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, RDAs. Um, forgive me. And um, it's about making those connections, creating a bit enough space to be able to have people interact and say, oh, well, I've, I've got this problem in my business. I'd really like to, to be able to get this material, but I don't know where to get it. And then somebody from across the room says, actually, I've got this material, or I know somebody who does. And then you do a deal. That's the way we think um, these sorts of opportunities might be found. Thank you. Um, just Nigel John, before we bring in James Curran and Ian Mingus, uh, roughly on this area, and then Colin Webster, and then... Alec Ferguson, the looks of it. So, Nigel Don. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And, and, and I will stay with the subject of materials and what is closer to recycling than remanufacture. I'm hoping we'll get to remanufacture eventually, but I'd like to come back to Ian Gillan's point about local authorities because they are our primary recyclers as the public see them and simply say, uh, and let's assume we could get all 32 authorities signed up one way or another. On what kind of time scale can you actually get local authorities? to change what they do. Presumably there are some fairly long-term contracts out there. There are some other constraints on what the public bodies can do. Can, can you give me any, any clues at all of that timetable on which you could actually do something even with the best will in the world? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, so the, the, the work that we're underway is, is analysing, I guess, the existing contracts local authorities have for, for, for the offtake of resources, I guess, uh, and trying to Im imagine that time frame. Uh, certainly some have short-term contracts. Uh, some uh, are yeah, tied into longer term deals, uh, so it would be over a period of time. Uh, I mean, in many ways, this is, this is them. They, they would still collect the materials. This is what they do. So, 
at their boundary in terms of the materials. Uh, so we're probably looking at, uh, depending when such a, if, if such a brokerage is, is kicked off more formally, uh, probably between sort of three and five years, you would start to see a significant move in terms of the amount of material that is available. Uh, but that does depend on the individual authorities uh, becoming part of it and, yeah, starting to you know, release, come out of other contracts they've got and start to move into this. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're still in the, the sort of development of that brokerage model in terms of what it would look like, what the, the, the sort of governance of that model would be and how it would do, integrate with the, the market. And there's obviously issues around procurement uh, in terms of public, public procurement and how uh, local authorities can interface with such a model going forward. So there's, there is some interests in that. Uh, but it is very, it's, it's been well received by local authorities in terms of the direction of travel. Uh, they're very interested in it. Some have already agreed in principle that this would be something they'd be like, they would like to, to go. Uh, it also depends, I guess, critically, and we're we'll getting into a bit of detail here, is, you know, if the first five authorities that, that came to the brokerage were the biggest authorities with the most materials, then that would accelerate that in terms of uh, del uh, deliverables, you know, nothing people who want to come in just now. So Ian Mingus and then James Curran first. Well, in terms of Education Scotland's perspective, it's really about how to be prepared the future generation for, for the changes that are going to be taking place in the Scottish economy. So our, our involvement began in 2011 when we were contacted by the Elmer Carter Foundation and University of Edinburgh. And we were really struck by their, you know, their, um, their motto, if you like, to inspire a generation to rethink, redesign and build a positive future. And for us, that really chimes very well with the premise of curriculum for excellence in terms of giving young people in Scotland the skills for learning life and work, making sure that they're prepared thoroughly for the, you know, a, a very changing world in the 21st century. The, as part of the curriculum, we're really developing higher order thinking skills in our young people, and we really like to the real focus in terms of the circular economy on systems thinking approach, we'll develop, which would develop those higher order thinking skills. And obviously one of the big contexts for learning within the curriculum is about interdisciplinary learning, joining up different disciplines. So we saw this has been a really rich context for learning that could bring together uh, science teachers, teachers from technologies background, from expressive arts, uh, maths, business studies, economics and so on. There's, you know, there's real opportunities there to get uh, strong interdisciplinary learning working in schools. And also one of the, the big things we want to achieve, one of the core skills for our young people in, in the changing world is for them to be scientifically, technologically literate citizens, you know, to really have a real understanding of these issues and be able to make informed decisions. And then collectively, you know, in terms of our work and our focus for Education Scotland, we're aware that the Scottish Government have identified science, technology, engineering, maths or STEM subjects as being a national priority for us and also learning for sustainability, which is a manifesto commitment. So we really saw the circular economy really pulling all of these together in a really exciting, innovative way. So over the last three years, we've been working in close partnership with El MacArthur Foundation. Uh, we've been very much part of that Team Scotland approach, working with the colleagues around the table here, which we value greatly. And for us, it's really that focus on skills. How do we build these skills in our young people just now? All the way from three years old upwards, not just secondary school, uh, from three years old upwards to make sure that young people have got that creativity and imagination to really develop these innovative solutions for the future to really drive Scotland forward and, and to better their own lives as well. So, you know, a really exciting opportunity and I think we've made a really good start over the last couple of years and uh, just this week on Friday actually we're bringing together a group of educators from around Scotland to think about the next steps and what our strategy might be for education in terms of taking this agenda forward. I think we'll try and come back to skills and, uh, you know, the, the theme that you've drawn there just in a wee while, because we're dealing with materials <coughs> and uh, scale uh, as well at the moment, the practicalities of that just now. And there was a number of people, I think, who wanted to come in on that one. First of all was James Curran and then Colin Webster. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a kind of fairly general point, I suppose, to, to, to open with, the, thinking back to what the circular economy really is at its heart. It's about... Um, biomaterials passing back into the biosphere through composting or other digestions and, and technical materials being reused within uh, the manufacturing e economy. But fundamental to both of those, a, a, a true circular economy must be based on renewable energy as well to drive it, uh, which makes me think that Scotland is in a, a really ideal position to grasp the circular economy and, and, and the depth 
an extent of the circular economy, probably better than any other country at, at the moment. So, we, but we're not going to do everything, I think, as, as Ian rightly pointed out. But there are some very good examples, I think, already developing. For, for example, as a company in Dumfries that uh, sources agricultural plastic and the food and drink and agricultural industries in Scotland are pretty successful. Uh, it sources agricultural plastic and turns that back into a, a building material, a plastic based building material very successfully. But it's importing agricultural plastic from, uh, from uh, a lot of it I, I knew some years ago, at least coming in from Ireland. There's also the um, turning of the, the old agricultural waste of tallow into a biofuel as well, uh, which is going on in, in central Scotland. So there's some very good examples of targeted interaction cross-sector, uh, building on some of the strengths that we already have in Scotland and, and using renewable energy to, to fuel those, or largely renewable energy in Scotland these days. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, there is an opportunity for, for clever, smart regulation to stimulate those kind of activities or, or smart standard set, setting. Uh, and um, I, I think there's a great opportunity to do clever thinking uh, about promoting the circular economy, but also pr promoting existing Scottish businesses at the moment. Uh, and I believe that opportunity lies in Section 82 of the Climate Change Act, which allows Scottish ministers to determine the recycled content of products used or manufactured in Scotland. And to do that smartly and cleverly, that will build Scottish industries, build on some of our strengths, and, and put us in a position that those industries can then um, go on and become internationally competitive. Uh, that would be a very good way of uh, using the tools that are already available to us. I'm Colin Webster. Yeah, well, really building on what James has said and, and going back to the point about scale and materials, I think it's, it's important to note that the circular economy isn't simply about dealing with materials at end of life and that there's been a lot of discussion about what you might do with, with recycling facilities and so on. The real, the real savings we see that can be made are at the start of life, at the designer's uh, stage. So, so working at how we can design products which don't go anywhere near a recycling facility would be uh, economically the wisest uh, move for us to make. So how do you do that, I guess, is, is the big question. It's about setting up system conditions. Uh, Ian Menzies talked about uh, some of the good work that we're doing in education. And I think that's a really vital part of that so that the designers and the business leaders of tomorrow can actually see that there are benefits of taking this closed loop approach. But it's also about, I would imagine, um, subsidising those activities that we, we do want to, to stimulate uh, rather than subsidising activities that uh, don't fit within a circular economy. And the great example of that is uh, subsidies for uh, fossil fuels, for example. Uh, but procurement policies too, which James was, was hinting at by talking about recycled content, I guess, uh, procurement policies are, can be there in order to stimulate circular design of products. And I think if, if Scotland's going to scale things up, it's about those inner loops uh, that we talk about. So uh, rather than recycling, it's about remanufacturing, it's about repair, it's about reuse. It's how we can keep things in those loops. Uh, that's where the, the real economic benefit is derived from. Um, that, that's very helpful. I, I wonder if Alec um, Ferguson's questions are on materials and scale. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. yeah. Scale and then and to certain extent terms. materials as well. Right. Actually, okay. Thank you. It's actually list just now because there's other people we want to bring in. My, my, my uh, as well. question fits in really well to this discussion, yep. um, and it really goes back to something that um, Dustin Benton was saying, which is is that if I if I picked you upright, sort of the, the easy thing to do is collect all your plastic bottles and send them to China. Um, job done but it's probably environmentally rather irresponsible way to go about it. And then you went on to say that if you become a little bit more specialist in your approach and therefore you sort of downscale the, the, the size of the scale of the operation, um, you, you will increase the value and probably achieve a better outcome. And it's certainly more environmentally responsible in terms of journey time, carbon footprint, etc. And, uh, and what I, the question I really want to put is, this, does, does this not all point towards... Um, a, a future where the small is beautiful in terms of a circular economy, rather what James Curran said about the excellent Solway recycling um, company in Dumfries, which is, he's, he's right, he specialises in tally and agricultural plastics, turns out a superb building material. And I'm aware I'm talking here about recycling rather, rather more than perhaps the circular economy, but I, I still haven't worked out in my mind where the, the difference comes, actually. But I just wonder if we're not looking more at small scale here being efficient and therefore something that fits into Scotland extremely well, um, rather than sort of massive large scale as Graham Day was mentioning with a, you know, have we got enough plastic to 
keep a plant going in the whole of England. I just wondered if anybody had any comment to make on that. Um, right. Can we see if we can get Dave's point if it's somewhere in the same area and then get some responses <coughs> to them both? And then uh, th thanks, Convener. Uh, just a couple of points. First of all, um, I think there's, there's obviously going to be a problem in terms of uh, our reuse and recycling and so on, you know, which we've, we've been pushing for some time in the circular economy in the sense that they're going to have to run in parallel, but one can militate against the other. Because, for, for example, if you are, um, say, say you have an incinerator or better still a pyrolysis plant, for instance, and you need to keep it going. You need a lot of plastics to keep that sort of thing going. So if you've got uh, one of these in your, your area and you're <clears throat> burning up all the plastic, that means the plastic's not available for further recycling. So that's just a, a kind of general point about how, where are the conflicts going to arise between reuse recycling and the circular economy? Because at some point, they're going to impact quite in a major way with each other. And the other one is the scale issue and particularly related to the Highlands and Islands. Um, for a number of years, I was Director of Protective Services for Highland Council, and one of my responsibilities was waste management and cleansing and, and, and so on. And lots of issues for us in the Highlands because we've got huge distances to travel. And um, we had to close our landfall site in Inverness uh, after a number of years, a landfall site that gave us a surplus of half a million a year. And then we had to start shipping the waste in lorries, either across to Peterhead or down to Perth. Now, there's a big environmental impact in doing that in terms of the transport itself and a cost. And I'm not sure what the current cost would be. But when I left the council back in 2001, I think we were paying five million a year, you know, to dispose of our waste, whereas before we were actually making half a million. <clears throat> now, there's a question about that five million quid could have maybe been used, this is annually, much, much better to develop, you know, um, recycling and other things locally in the Highlands. So I'd, what I'm, what I'm saying, or what I'm asking, I suppose, is that you need to look differently in the Highlands and Islands to how you deal with some of these things, because there's no point in taking a plastic bottle from Wick, you know, right to the other end of the country. You're far better doing something with it in the north, and that might be through a pyrolysis plant or something else, although I know that these things are very, very uh, controversial. Um, but we've got to look at that kind of negative uh, environmental impact you know, that can arise from trying to do these things. So just these two points I wanted to throw okay. into the mix. We have a number of people who wanted to come in, and I've obviously tried to include as many uh, as possible, but Marilyn Wakefield and then Ian Gallon. Um, well, we're a um, deal with glass and glass recycling insofar as that we produce uh, and have developed through R&D uh, a product called Active Filtration Media. It's used as a direct replacement in um, filters instead of sand. It works better than sand, and um, we've developed the market for this. And last year, we built a four and a half million factory in order to um, produce this because we have a worldwide market for it. It's self-cleaning, and it um, it will last the life of the filter. Now, for this plant at the moment, I mean, last year we did 2,000 tonnes of glass. You reuse recycled glass. And this year already, up into April, we've used 3,000 tonnes, and we're still in um, the beginnings of the stage and still reprocessing things because the plant is new and it's never been done before, and we're still developing it as we go along. Now, already we have a market for it, which we're developing in the States. So we're looking now at building another plant. Now, it very much depends on where we build this plant as to getting our raw materials, because already we are finding problems in getting the raw materials. Um, we need to get glass which is processed to a certain state. So we need to, um, because there's a lot of impurities in, in the paper, in the plastics, in, in everything that comes with recycled glass. So we need to get it semi-processed. Um, our next plant might be able to take the bottles with everything, but at the moment we have huge troubles getting paper out. So what's paramount to us is that when we get, or when you get recycled product, and I'm sure it's in the same in every industry, whether it's plastics or cardboard, is that you want the actual glass. You don't want all the other bits that come with it. Um, 
So it's really important that we don't mix our glass because it's, we, we, we need green glass. And green glass is, is the, the glass which is the least um, wanted and used. And it's the green or the brown, not the clear glass that we want. Because it, um, when you break it down, uh, uh, white glass, uh, clear glass has got flint in it and it um, breaks differently. And it's very important, the size and the particle shape. Um, it is um, negatively charged, so it actually sterilises at the same time. Um, so it doesn't get clogged like sand. Sand, um, after a number of times of using it, um, coagulates and becomes channels, and uh, it doesn't work effectively, and then you have to recycle that. Whereas the actual the AFM will last the life of the filter, and even in our next um, factory, we could even, when the filter is finished, take the sand out and, and reactivate it again. But it's crucial that we can get supplies. Already we're finding it difficult getting supplies. The supply chain is, is quite tied up insofar as it's some contracts with the likes of Viridur, they have for 10 years, they have for 20 years, they have for 25 years, and it's difficult getting in there. And comparatively, we're, we're small with regard to the remelt industries, and they take huge amounts of the glass. So they're, they're, are their first customers. Um, we, the Viridur are building, um, there are only six colour sorts in the UK. Viridur is doing another one through in Glasgow. We've approached Viridur and already they're telling us that everything that they make there is earmarked for England. Now we import our glass from England. If, if we can't get the proper glass for a new factory, we can't build it in Scotland. We have to go elsewhere. We have to find a source of glass. But Scotland has enough glass for us if we can get it. We need about, um, you know, we can do, for the present factory we have it now, we'll do 40,000 tonnes a year. For the new one we want to build, it'll be 120,000 tonnes. Um, and if we can't get it in Scotland, then that plant will have to go to Germany or wherever we can get the raw materials. Good. The practical thoughts about this are uh, precisely the kind of things that we want to dig into. Um, Ian Gulland, just now, uh, before we bring in others. Yeah, um, sorry, I was I'll to respond to the, the scale thing and the small scale versus large scale. I guess uh, I mean the, the simple answer is uh, yes, we can. You know, it doesn't have to be big. You know, the, the sort of reprocessing that we're talking about uh, doesn't have to be big. Obviously, you know, there is an attraction to scale for, for the people who are investing in that. But I think technology, on a number of fronts, is changing and becoming much more uh, mobile and adaptable at, at, at smaller levels. I mean, you look at something like anaerobic digestion. Perhaps, uh, you know, we've invested heavily in that in Scotland, and that's very good. Uh, but a lot of the plants, the early, the early plants for anaerobic digestion have been on quite a significant scale. But that technology is advancing over time, and you're looking at smaller scale applications for anaerobic digestion, new technologies coming on the market, some, some being developed here in Scotland, some, some abroad. Uh, and, you know, they might have applications certainly in the future uh, in sort of rural parts of Scotland uh, particularly. So. That's constantly happening. So I think you know we, we are seeing much more uh, opportunities uh, at sort of smaller scale, local level. Uh, I think it's also one of the challenges here: are we trying to look after our own materials? Clearly, that, that's where we're trying to add value uh, to our own supply chain. So we're not exporting materials, but there is also an opportunity to to bring in materials or products from from out with Scotland, and you know instead of exporting, importing. Uh, that material to add value to. I mean, Hewlett Packard, HP, run a, a reuse and remanufacturing of, of uh, uh, computers and everything, uh, hardware in a, in a factory in Greenock. I think it's Greenock, I believe. Uh, but that, that's for the whole of North Europe. They're bringing stuff in from all of those places. So that's, that's a success story. Uh, so that's not just looking at hardware from Scotland. That's looking at beyond it. So the th I think these opportunities exist, but it's, it's, it's you know, both small scale and large scale. Uh, I think the rural part is very interesting, uh, and I think it is about trying to look creatively, and I think uh, Ian, Ian Menzies talked about that as well, going forward in terms of entrepreneurship and, and people thinking more creatively. And I, I, mean, I know from previous experience that uh, in Shetland they had a particular uh, focus on glass. Instead of shipping glass all the way to the central belt, they developed decorative slabbing and stuff like that and created a a small business in Shetland which actually started exporting these decorative slabs. So that's just not, I know it's a small example, but that's where particular focus is on, on specific materials. And, and I think that's something that you know, I know from, from previous work that I've been involved in is, is very, very, very obvious to the rural economies. And uh, certainly our programme is, is keen to help those types of things. So it's not all about let's 
you know, get everything into the central belt or let's get something to the, to the bigger markets overseas. It is trying to get that kind of mixed economy. And I, but I think technology is, is, is helping now. We are seeing much more uh, dynamic solutions uh, around local, you know, local delivery. Uh, but yeah, it's a different mindset, I guess, uh, in terms of the more traditional, put it in a big container truck and ship it to somewhere else. It is looking, trying to, somebody else talked about separating the materials out more creatively and trying to understand we could do something with one type of plastic, not all plastics, uh, in the rural parts of Scotland. So how do we actually separate that out? Um, sticking with materials and scale, uh, uh, and before Alison leads on skills and that sort of thing, for the benefit of those who are sitting to, to come in on that, um, uh, Lucy Chamberlain on this point. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, echo something that uh, Walter Stahl said to the committee last October about scale, which was the importance of uh, embracing both a global as well as a local and regional scale uh, in terms of circular economy. Obviously, Scotland is never going to be manufacturing everything itself within the country. Um, but it is very important, I think, for Scotland to look at the waste hierarchy carefully and to look in terms of reuse and repair because repair and reuse are things that should and could happen within a Scottish context um, and within a local and uh, a regional context. Um, and, and for that to happen, it's important that um, manufacturers release uh, the manuals um, the design manuals for their products so that local small repairers are able to, um, to repair the products at a local level in a very safe way. Um, so, so that's something that we would advocate. Okay. Uh, to um, uh, Dustin and uh, James and Colin on this set. All right. Yeah. Just to pick up on some of the points, uh, particularly I was taken by the question, is small beautiful? And for certain things it absolutely is, but for other things it absolutely is not. So let me give you a couple of examples. Auto catalysts, they're filled with platinum, palladium, gold, all these very exciting materials. Um, they're collected at a European scale. 10% of them get processed in a factory in Gloucestershire. Uh, they get remelted, and then the melted stuff gets shipped to the United States to be refined back, in, and very finely, back into, into the particular material types. They then get shipped back to Europe for manufacturing to stick back into cars. There's nothing that we're going to do about that. That's a global system because gold, platinum, palladium are worth so much money. Uh, plastics are something that, as, as was said, if we source separate into particular material types, it would make more sense to do them at a local to regional scale rather than shipping them across the world on a carbon footprint basis. Food, anything that's organic and wet, that naturally wants to be at a very small scale. Um, for remanufacturing, this is really sector specific. I think the example of HP's facility uh, is a good one. We know that remanufacturing could happen in Scotland, but Scotland will be competing with other countries across Europe because as you raise the value of whether it's a material or a product, you can pay for more transport. So it's about getting a factory wherever you want it and then pulling in materials and products to Scotland and then exporting. That's a circular economy that can work at a regional scale. And that's really a question of both industrial policy and how do you get factories built, which is not my area of specialty. Reuse is also something that can happen at a really small scale because demand and supply is very locally correlated. So there's no point in sending it around, even if it's worth a lot. I'd just like to also pick up on this point about material constraints and, and lock-in. We do know that there, are, there is a risk that we end up using materials for something which is relatively low value when we could be using for them for higher value. So let me give you an example of some technology scales. We know that uh, oil refineries, or if you wanted to do biofuels in a really, uh, in a really sort of cost-effective way, you need to do it at very large scale, so five megatons of material per year. And just to give a, a sense of scale, uh, there was an analysis done for Scotland looking at how much organic material is potentially available. It's about nine to 13 megatons. So if we collected everything from food waste to agricultural materials that are byproducts or waste to uh, forestry byproducts, you might be able to support one, maybe one and a half big biofuels plants. In contrast, if you feed that material into a biorefinery and ferment it to get uh, lactic acid, which you can then in turn into polylactic acid, which is a type of plastic, you can do that, we reckon, this is more technologically uncertain, but at a scale of perhaps 50 to 100,000 tons per year. So you could potentially have many more 
and that is likely to be a more valuable product as well. So in effect, you end up with a trade-off between quite certain but really very large-scale things, recycling processes, big-scale things, and more technically uncertain but potentially more valuable and potentially smaller-scale things. And this is why in, our, in the submission and in our work, we focus very much on the opportunity for Scotland for innovation policy. We think that if Scotland can develop some of these exciting new technologies, protein extraction from pot ale syrup, as I mentioned before, those are the areas where Scotland might be able to get factories that work for Scotland scale. I'm into the skills and education, but uh, just you know, very soon. But uh, taking uh, on the theme still on materials and size, I think James Curran and Colin Webster wanted to come back in. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up on three elements very briefly. I, I promise you from the earlier di discussion, I think it's very difficult to be prescriptive about the scale of the potential scale of the circular economy, either in time or space. Uh, because one example that springs to my mind is the imminent decommissioning of uh, many enormous installations from the North Sea oil and gas fields. Uh, and it just seems to me that, that there must be a business opportunity and perhaps Scotland should look at it as, as, as to um, recycling, again using renewable energy, uh, the, the steel embedded in those installations back into the, uh, into the wider economy and to release that low embedded carbon steel back into the economy here in Scotland might be a very good idea. Um, the, the, there were earlier questions about um, flow of some materials and particularly plastics into uh, pyrolysis plants and so on. Um, and two things occurred to me there. What, one is that we shouldn't forget we actually have millions of tonnes of available plastic in Scotland, but they're buried in landfills at the moment. And we shouldn't forget there's actually a, a buried resource there. And at some point in the future, those could be mined for the materials that are stored in those landfills, uh, which would be a good thing environmentally and, and hopefully economically. And the final thing is on, on understanding where waste is coming from, uh, the point I think made by Dryden. Um, we, we, have a, we are currently developing a bid with other partners to put into the European Life um, uh, uh, Fund to, to, to provide real-time information on waste transfers whenever anybody transfers waste from uh, organisation to B or whatever, uh, they have to submit waste transfer. It's a very kind of uh, old-fashioned system at the moment to get that online real-time would then allow everyone to understand where wastes are flowing and, and, and to make the best economic, economic opportunity of them. So, uh, Colin Webster. Yeah, again, on, on, the, on, the, on scale, size and, and cross-border um, opportunities, just a, a point to make for anyone who is unaware that the, the Scottish Government was the first national government to become a member of our Circular Economy 100 programme, which is a programme which brings together corporations, emerging innovators and, and geographic regions uh, to look at the circular economy to see how it can be scaled up and a, and a collaborative approach. And um, other geographies that are part of this now include Wallonia, Central Denmark, Bavaria, Amsterdam. Um, so there's this growing body of, of geographies interested in this. And I know that from discussions I've had with, with some of the members of the Scottish Government who've been part of um, all those talks around the Circular Economy 100, that already collaborations are starting up, which are, are, are of great interest. Um, a couple of other things. One is we're, we're running something called Project Mainstream, which is looking at pure material f flows. And this is something that we're doing with a, a range of CEOs across Europe to, to see about how you facilitate effective flows. And of course, we're looking at the, the cross collaboration approach, the cross sector and, and cross chain approach to see uh, where the potentials are there to scale up the, the circular economy uh, very quickly. Um, uh, and another point to make is that it would be worth keeping an eye on the European Resource Efficiency Platform. Uh, it's a platform that, that we are part of, uh, and we think that's interesting because the, it's likely that industrial policies in Europe will follow from, from the recommendations of the Resource Efficiency Platform. And a couple of points that they make which are relevant to the discussion we're having is, is one is that the EU waste policy should promote benefits of cross-border flows, which is the kind of thing I guess we've been talking about around the table. Uh, and the other is that we need to create a pan-European network of industrial symbiosis initiatives. Um, so there's, the, again, opportunities for one person's waste to become another person's food. And I, I do think we need to move away from the talk of waste because the, one of the key uh, goals of the circular economy is to eliminate that concept of waste. So there's no such thing as waste. It's simply food for secondary cycles or for subsequent cycles, perhaps a better way to put it. Uh, we'll just finish up this section and move on to another theme. Yeah. 
just picking up on James Curran, if, if I may, uh, talking about the oil and gas industry, just, I mean, it's obviously been highlighted as well as a possible opportunity, just to really flag up, because there is, and again, to reinforce, there is a lot happening in this space already, that actually, as, as today, uh, we're, we're working with the DECOM North Sea uh, trade, trade body for the decommissioning of North Sea uh, companies. Uh, there's an event in Aberdeen talking about this opportunity, uh, looking at the circular economy, what, what the, the opportunities are around the decommissioning of North Sea, looking at reuse. And it's not just about, you know, clearly the recycling of the, the metal infrastructure is, is you know, obvious to, to, to many, but it's also about the, you know, the valves, the, the kit that's on those rigs, uh, all the, in, the subsea infrastructure as well, and how that could be reused uh, and some of it remanufactured within the supply chains or the resupply chains here in Scotland and then possibly exported to other uh, oil uh, installations around the world. And it is, it's a huge opportunity in terms of, for Scotland, uh, really at the forefront of this, because it's the first, as far as I'm aware, the very first sort of, uh, sort of uh, oil field that's going through this phase uh, in the world. So people in the sort of uh, Ch Chinese Sea and, and, the and, the, and the Gulf of Mexico and stuff like that are, are really looking at this and saying, how, are we, how can you go through a kind of decommissioning phase like this and ensure that you're looking at the recycling, reuse and remanufacturing of the kit uh, in terms of just disposing of it? So I think there's, a, you know, there's an event of, on today that uh, obviously uh, you know, is starting that kind of conversation. Um, Alison McInnes would like to kick us off on skills and so forth. Before and, I, so can I have yeah. I just one yeah. brief supplementary to, huh? to Mr Curran um, on, on what he just said there about waste transfer. Um, it seems to me that with public sector sharing information, not just across agencies, but with the public in an open source way, um, would surely spark quite a lot of um, new initiatives if, if entrepreneurs had access to that sort of information. Is that something that has been considered? Yeah, I, I agree absolutely, and um, I, I can't promise you that it's in the life bid, but if I'm allowed to check up, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, okay. Uh, moving on to um, something Colin Webster said, which was um, we, we, we need to look at the design industry and we need to scale up the design industry to, to look at new ways of remanufacturing. So the role of design at the very early um, stages, we've talked about education um, at secondary school level, but we've not talked about the role of universities, colleges, uh, research institutes in, in opening that up. And the role of, I think, perhaps another skill um, is the new business model. So the role of Scottish Enterprise and helping businesses look at new business models such as um, leasing or servicing rather than, than, than encouraging everyone always to, to, to buy. Um, I'd be interested in perhaps hearing some of the panel's views on the area of skills and design. I don't know whether Gordon wants to come in just now. For come in. Uh, I, mean, I think it's kind of a good example there that didn't refer to it as the circular economy when we're talking about oil and gas as around decommissioning. So I think there's a lots of activity actually underway and it's maybe badged or branded as, as other types of activity, whether it's low carbon or, or, or work in that, that area. I think in terms of the, the universities, I think we need to look at the investments that have been made through the Funding Council in terms of the innovation centres. So if we look at the new industrial biotech facility that's been laid by Strathclyde University, it's uh, taken on uh, a leading role of 11 of uh, Scotland's uh, universities. And I think in those areas, it's the combination of the linkages and knowledge transfer back from universities back into industry, where we'll get the innovation and where we'll get the, the kind of key economic uh, steps that we need to, to make in this, this area. Uh, in a kind of practical sense, and the point was made earlier on around renewable energy, we've spent a lot of time and the work that we undertake with the industry leadership group around energy, uh, developing the workforce around Scotland's renewable uh, sector. Uh, and obviously, uh, perhaps uh, the growth in that hasn't been just as uh, we anticipated. But we feel as if we've built a real strong infrastructure across both our universities and uh, the college sector. So the colleges have formed an energy skills partnership with the strategic hubs around the development activity. So we know where the kind of expertise is and we can connect up colleges. So in some of the work we've done around, say, like wind turbine technology, we've connected up Inverness and Fife, which was the kind of pioneer for this work, but then into Ayrshire College and Dumfries and Galloway. So I feel as if we've uh, made a good foundation for that, for that work. Uh, 
If we look broader than that into the wider STEM agenda, and Ian touched on it earlier, a whole range of activities within both schools and colleges just now have a much stronger focus on the science uh, sectors and trying to grow and, and develop that further. And I think we've made good progress, uh, particularly on the kind of gender-related issues, but just uh, making science more accessible. Uh, so I think the kind of good work done, done there. Uh, we're doing more in schools, uh, and again, perhaps not badged up under circular economy, but I think if you look at it and around, it certainly fits. So we've been working with the SCDI in Scotland around the Soul Tire Foundation. We've got somewhere in the region of 180 schools this year competing for the Soul Tire Award which is a school-based project around uh, wave and wind technology, and the finals are coming up soon at uh, Murrayfield. And I think it's a good example of taking kind of concepts of the type of activity that we're trying to create through Curriculum for Excellence, but to take it into a kind of very, very practical way. Also doing some really good work in the schools in East Ayrshire, probably leading around the uh, primary engineer and just taking engineering related disciplines into the school and making it uh, accessible. And then where possible, and we're looking probably off the back of uh, the review of Scotland's uh, young workforce that's been led by Serene Wood, to how we can engage businesses more effectively in this, this area. And probably a good example for us is the Scottish Leather Group in Bridge of Weir who have followed a, a very aggressive zero waste uh, campaign within their own uh, factory. But they've got a very deep school engagement programme across the uh, Renfrewshire and Inverclyde in terms of taking the schools and showing them, well, many of the locals will know what the smell comes from, <laughs> the smell comes from, from the process, but actually showing them how the factory have advanced. Uh, they've got uh, virtually self-sufficient in terms of their energy production, but how they've extracted a lot of other materials such as collagen and others from the cow hides before they go for, for processing. So I think a good story to tell. We can always do more. We're doing more with uh, Education Scotland, want to do more with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as well, and just to bring a bit to uh, probably branding around the concept of the circular economy. It's, hard enough thing for businesses, I think, to get their heads round about when you take it into primary schools. It gets that bit more complicated as well, just to, just to explain that process. Ian Mingus want to say a bit more about that just now? Or? Um, I mean, yes, and you're obviously working with um, Skills Development Scotland and other partners to really take forward our science, technology, engineering, maths agenda. So, um, you know, as we sort of grow those different strategies and really support the development of those aspects of the curriculum, then... I think you know we can really look at opportunities to bring the circular economy into that. But I mean, one of the things we talked about is about bringing it into primary schools. That's, that's our ambition. Do you know, we, you know, there's young people in primary schools do have a really good understanding, a really good connection to these issues. And really, you know, the initial phase of our, phase of our work has been really around secondary schools. But uh, we really think there's real scope to bring the circular economy into primary schools and nurseries as well, because they're really engaging in issues around waste and eco schools and that type of stuff. And, uh, we really want to challenge them more and bring more challenge into learning and develop those higher order thinking skills at a younger age. So there's real opportunities all the way through so the school years, if you like, to do that. Uh, and Lucy, yours. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to highlight the importance of um, creating a very strong design network in Scotland. Um, obviously, um, as, as most of you probably know, um, 80% of the environmental impacts of a product are embedded at the design stage. So it is a really, really crucial phase um, for intentional design for a circular economy uh, to happen. Um, and it's also uh, something that really connects the arts and the sciences, I think. Um, so you talk about STEM education. Well, I think the, the arts side is also important, uh, especially in terms of things like communication. When it comes to behaviour change, for instance, um, lots of people talk about behaviour change and the difficulties of behaviour change for a circular economy. Well, design is one of the major influences on behaviour change, not just product design, but also service and system design. Um, which is crucially important. Um, I just wanted to give the example um, of Gothenburg, uh, a city which has transformed 
the way it deals with its waste. Its uh, Civic Waste Amenity Centre is now called an amusement park, and it incorporates a shop, a restaurant. It had an art exhibition last year. It has a turnover of, of about one and a half million, and it employs local people. And I think that should be the vision for redesigning our waste centres. Um, one of the things that the Great Recovery has produced over the last two years has been uh, our four design models, which is a very simple and engaging diagram showing uh, these four models of longevity, of uh, leasing or service, remanufacturing, and finally, material recovery or recycling. So recycling is really a last resort because in most cases it's downcycling and it involves a loss of energy and a loss of value. So we need to be thinking about design for longevity and design for leasing or service first and foremost. Um, one of the issues that we have with designers um, is that there's currently no provision for continuing professional development, CPD, for the design industry. So that is available for waste industry, but not for the design industry. And we, we would like to see that change so that designers can take time out to learn about circular economy um, design. Uh, one of the things that the Great Recovery will be working on over the next year or two will be um, design residencies, so setting designers up uh, rather like artists in residence at waste recovery facilities, engaging them with the waste processes, with the challenges of waste recovery so that they actually engage with those problems and are then able to go back to the drawing board and redesign the products um, so that waste uh, is, is less of an issue, ultimately designing waste out of the system. Um, so uh, we, would, we would very much advocate, you, you have here a remanufacturing innovation hub that uh, Zero Waste Scotland are working on, and we would very much advocate uh, a design innovation hub for Scotland along the same lines. Okay. Um, Dave Thompson wanted to come in and then Colin Webster. <coughs> yeah, ju just on the point of design, convener, I mean, it's a very interesting point. And uh, what is the position now, though, in terms of built in obsolescence? I mean, I came across this first, I don't know, over 40 years ago, you know, with a wee camera which had a bit in it which was designed to make the whole thing fail after a relatively short time. And the camera would have probably gone on for years and years. That, that's been going on. There's all sorts of ways that manufacturers can make sure that things or components, you know, fail, which means people have to, you know, buy new ones quite often. How do we get that message across? Is, is the message that the circular economy will make them money going to overrule their desire to make money in the short term, maybe, rather than the medium or longer term, by building in obsolescence. And there are so many things that we use these days that we have to throw away. And it really goes against the grain. When I was a boy, everything was recycled, you know, and uh, I hoard things in my garage, much to my wife's annoyance. But uh, I always find a use for it eventually. So how do we deal with this built-in obsolescence thing that I'm sure is still there to a great extent? that it's a, uh, a huge problem. I think uh, one of the things we have now is, is more kind of um, technological obsolescence as well. So people have a mobile phone for a year and the expectation is that after a year, a year and a half, they throw it away and get the newest model. People are conditioned to want the latest model. Um, one of the things that um, a few companies are looking at is the idea of modular design so that you can have a new model by changing perhaps the cover of the phone, the colour, the outside, so it looks like a new product. But actually the inside of mobile phones haven't changed that much uh, in a few years. And you don't really need a new circuit board when you, when you have a new phone. You just want something that, that looks new. So I think the idea of modularity, design for modularity, is, is a very key one to, to look into uh, here. And also I'd go back to my earlier point about repair. Things are not designed to be repaired. 
they're designed to be thrown away. Um, and, and I think that's really key to make sure that we are putting pressure on manufacturers um, to ensure that their products are repairable. Um, you might like to look at the Restart project, which is engaging a lot of communities um, in England at the moment around repairing their own electronics um, and, and doing that very much from a bottom-up approach. But it is about um, engaging with manufacturers over the design manuals, the manufacturing manuals, and actually having a right to repair. So in the US, the right to repair for uh, automobiles is, you know, it's, it's a, a right for everybody. There's no right to repair for home ele electronics, and I think that's something that should, uh, should be looked at and, sh and should, should change. Um, just, just one more thing about obsolescence. It's often a very few number of components that break in a particular product, and it's always often the same components. Um, so I think if a product is designed for repair, those things can easily be replaced. But it is about working with manufacturers on design, on modularity, and on those repair uh, and manufacturing manuals. We've got Colin Webster, Ian Gill, and James Curran, and Nigel Don. And then you and Mearns after that on this uh, theme. So first of all, Colin Webster. Okay, thank you. Uh, so very much on the point of design for obsolescence and skills. Uh, I think what's really important in, in our work is that we get across this point, uh, in our work in education, is to say we get across this point that design for obsolescence uh, lives in a particular context, in a context that perhaps isn't there any longer. And this is a, a real key part of, of what we do in education, is getting people to understand the whole system's complexity of uh, why things are the way they are and how things could be. So what's, what's the context that's missing? The context that's missing is uh, there's no longer uh, cheap and falling prices for materials or for energy. And, and when those conditions are in place, just those two by, by themselves, it's likely that manufacturers will design for obsolescence because it's cheaper to produce next year. Uh, therefore, they want to keep this flow of income coming in. And that flow of income is important too. There's another context that's missing, is that the public doesn't have the income it used to have. Manufacturers are finding that there isn't the market for their stuff in the West any longer in the way that there used to be. So without those three factors in, face, in place, design for obsolescence actually is, is uh, perhaps not the wisest business move. And I say this in order to, to make the point about whole systems design, that when you take on the circular economy to education, uh, or even to business, of course, what's really important is that people understand all of the implications, that this isn't a model for uh, environmentalism, it's not a model for reduction of waste, it's not simply a model for redesign, it's not simply a model for, for business, for, for how we could uh, run our businesses, but rather it's for all of these things and more. It's the energy, it's the, ultimately it's the economics, um, and that, that's the point we're always trying to get across in our education work. And we think it's really important that you share a compelling vision of how the economy could be. And that, that compelling vision is based around uh, abundance, it's based around potential, it's based around positive growth and the opportunity for people to get involved in it. And whenever we talk about the circular economy, those, those are the messages that we always want to get across. And I, I completely agree with Lucy and a lot of what she was saying about how you develop that sort of designer culture. And I see that in Scotland, the Mac Lab. Uh, which is a facility for people to go to and, and repair goods or even to design some themselves. Uh, they're launching in five cities across Scotland, so that, that certainly helps with this whole design culture. Uh, and equally, I spoke recently with Codebase, who do something similar in IT, I believe. Um, so there, there's certainly the seeds of things happening in Scotland to help with uh, design for the next generation. Uh, Ian Gilland. Yeah. Thanks. I, I was actually going to pick up on uh, what Alison uh, to my left was talking about in terms of supporting new business models uh, in, in Scottish businesses. But firstly, I, I just would like to emphasise from our point of view, Zero Waste Scotland, uh, how important investment in skills to the future is. It really is fundamental in this, in this shift. Uh, and selfishly as well, because you know, others around the table will be the same. When we, when we engage with businesses currently, uh, you know, particularly SMEs, it's it's the absence of, of knowledge and awareness of, of many of the things we're talking about, not just circular economy, behavior, but resource efficiency, waste issues, and energy and stuff like that. You know, and uh, that you know, and, and I think that you know, getting everybody you know through schools, through the curriculum, through university, regardless of their career choice, uh, and more of an understanding of, of what this is all about, is going to build that foundation going forward. So absolutely, investing in the future is paramount. But I think that the issue about business models, and I think 
you, you can pick up on this as well, because uh, this is about this is different for going into a business and, and talking to an environmental officer about how do you, with every respect, change the light bulbs or put some insulation in the building and stuff like that. Uh, this is about going into a boardroom uh, and having a conversation about the business model. You know, the fact that they might be selling stuff in a in a set way to the market or taking a product to the market or making the product out of specific materials. This is asking them to change that business model, uh, and they need to have obviously a, a, a credible business case for doing that, but they need to be confident and they need to see uh, signals from uh, both the marketplace or through procurement uh, or through materials and stuff like that, that this is the right thing to do. And obviously through their sector. Uh, so it's about you know, highlighting where people are doing this, uh, both in terms of Scotland, both in terms of the UK and in Europe, where businesses are leading on this. So business you know, chief execs, etc., or boards of companies are thinking, yeah, this is the direction of travel. So there's a lot of engagement that needs to happen at boardroom level, but it's giving people the confidence and it's sending the signals out. We've, we've touched upon already about, you know, is there sort of fiscal incentives uh, to, to encourage this? Because I think that's really one of the, the challenges for businesses is a business making this decision to change its business model, you know, it's a leap of faith uh, for many of them, particularly SMEs. Uh, and, you know, I think they're, they're looking for some, you know, some support uh, in that, through that transition. Uh, it's obviously very easy for some of the bigger companies to kind of go off and have a, have a product, uh, you know, that doesn't really interfere with their main business and sort of float that in the market and see how it goes. But for SMEs in the supply chain in Scotland, uh, you know, it will, it, to fiscal and yeah, regulatory yeah. levers. Yeah, but, just to, just, but, but I think it's just, it's just, and, and we're obviously just, just to, we're obviously working directly with Scottish Enterprise on that. We have a project. Again, we've talked about Europe, collaborating with Europe to look at how we uh, promote business models, look at particular types of business models, and then working with Scottish Enterprise and their account managers and trying to how, how we could support businesses who are who are thinking about changing their business model or certainly looking to, to move forward. So there is support out there, but it is about working directly with the business sector, raising confidence, uh, procurement, we've talked about that, signals from, the, the, from within the public sector about the, the, the direction of procurement, how these products and services might be, might be the future, uh, will give confidence to people in Scotland, particularly that the, there is going to be a market for those services. So there's, there's, there's a bit of work there that's obviously started, uh, but certainly you know, we really do need to, 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 to build a confidence in the business community. I know it's a circular economy and it's a circular set of issues that uh, will make it work, but we, <laughs> it's difficult to keep to themes that yeah, allow sorry. people because someone else wants to ask questions, some of us want to answer them. Um, if we could get... Um, James Curran on this matter. I think it was skills where we're kind of going around. <laughs> well, sorry, well we what was it that you were going to um, throw into this? No, no, it, it was actually picking up very much on what Ian was said about the, the, the business model for the circular economy, because I think part of the business model, and I'll pick up some, some of the earlier comments as well, part of the business model for the circular economy must be about developing the, the consumer. Because what does the consumer actually want? It's the consumer wants the service, not particularly mm. a product. So the consumer maybe uh, wants chilled food, doesn't actually want a fridge. Uh, and already one of the most sustainable companies in the world, I, I believe, is, is providing carpets that companies can rent rather than buy for carpeting their offices. So that is the kind of model we need in the future. And then the, the provider of that carpet uh, takes it back and either refurbishes it or, or, or recycles it into a new, a, a new carpet in the future. That is part of the circular economy business model. And I think elements of, of that are already embedded within our regulatory framework because the, the waste electrical and electronic equipment directive and the end of life vehicle directive both require the provider of the product to take the product back at the end of life. Now there is an incentive in there, we could go much further I think, but there's an incentive in there to make that product such that they don't have to take it back as often, um, but also if they do take it back then they can either refurbish it or, or maintain it and, and then reissue it, or at the very least completely disassemble it and use all the embedded materials. Indeed. Um Nigel, Don. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's a very useful introduction because I think that's that's what I really wanted to pick up on and something that uh, I think Lucy Chamberlain said about uh, the right to repair because I'm hoping by the time we've finished we'll have a few clues as to what we as legislators might be wanting to do eventually. Uh, and and, and um, picking up on what James Curran has just said about fridges, I, I, I'm, I'm going back to my first industrial experience 
actually my second industrial experience, um, of washing machines and thinking nobody wants to buy a washing machine. What they want is a machine that will wash their clothes. You'd much rather rent it. You'd much rather that it was supplied by somebody that when it broke down simply came and repaired it. And if they couldn't repair it, they took it away and replaced it with another one. Uh, and that seems to me to be a very good business model. And I'm just wondering whether that has some consequences. First of all, it does encourage people to make them last a while because, as James Curran has just said, you, know, you, you actually don't want to come and repair it. You want it to work. Um, but it also perhaps does something for standardization. The last time ours did break down, the man said, well, I think I've got one of those seals in the van. I go and look, and mercifully he did. But surely if all washing machines were on this kind of we'll rent, you rent it, we'll keep it running, then people would pretty quickly standardize on everything. They've already standardized on the size. They would pretty quickly get to the point where actually it just became a commodity, which is what it frankly should be. And I'm wondering whether some of the branding would disappear and we'd actually get more functional goods. And it seems to me that's actually a good thing. And that's a part of the model I just want to sort of throw in there as a, as a thought. Is that where we should be going? Right, well, as we go on through this uh, discussion, we've got uh, Ewan Mearns, Ian Mingus, and Ian Gilland. And uh, Lucy wants to come back in as well. Is that right? Okay. Oh, well, quick answer to it then, okay. Um, I, I believe that already happens in Germany um, with, I, I think it's Miel. Um, they provide uh, high class washing machines and they provide the service along with them. So you essentially buy a machine for life and it lasts many, many years. Back on that very briefly, Miele always did make the best washing machines, actually. It was well known in the industry. Um, and it's not at all surprising that they're the ones who've actually developed that model because they were clearly in a class of their own 25 years ago. After that short ad advertising break, um, uh, Ewan Mearns. Thank you. I, I just wanted to kind of pick up on many of these points. I mean, we're talking about design, uh, business model, innovation, skills. For the company perspective, this is about innovation. This is what the circular economy is really about, doing new things or doing things differently. But you need to position innovation within the context of the business's strategy. Um, and, you know, to want, uh, we mentioned this morning, you know, the circular economy is about an economic um, uh, opportunity for Scotland that also has environmental uh, benefit. So, um, I, I really wanted to, to, to kind of state the uh, importance of looking at this as an economic opportunity uh, and, and then taking it down to a practical level, uh, working with companies the Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, do. Um, so we're working with our account managers to enable them to understand where the opportunities lie <clears throat> and then to be able to best advise uh, companies. So starting with this demand-led approach and thinking about how we can best support companies to uh, to uh, take that leap of faith, as, as Ian was saying, how to reduce the risk for them to, to innovate, to, to, to do things in, in, in new ways. Um, there are also other, other benefits to companies if you wanted to take this down to a more, a more practical level. Uh, we've talked about resource efficiency, but in terms of the scale of the, the savings that could be made through remanufacturing, we're talking about potential, potentially 50 or 80 percent uh, savings in energy used to, uh, to repair or to remanufacture a product. You know, this is a radical, uh, um, uh, takes us into the realm of radical savings. Um, business model innovation might seem a, a big step, but already there are companies who are doing this. You know, in Agreco, we've got the, the global leader in heating and temperature control solutions. They lease out their equipment globally. Uh, Minetti in, in, in the borders, again, is uh, uh, changed from a manufacturer, a plastics manufacturer of coat hangers into a, a logistics, a recycling company that completely changed their business model. They, they now supply almost half the, um, the coat hangers in, in high street retailers up and down the UK. So there are good examples and we need to promote that. Uh, but in addition, uh, there's benefits in terms of collaboration for companies, both up and down the supply chain and also with, with, with customers. We've touched on it uh, before. So the old linear model was about throughput. It was about turnover and volume. But perhaps in the future, the value is created through the depth and the quality of those customer relationships where you can go back and have that customer loyalty. Uh, and that's what creates the value. You've got a product that, which is then upgradable uh, rather than just uh, disposable at the end of it. So, you know, part of the challenge is, is saying to companies, there is a different way. 
there's a different way for you to, to operate your, your business. So what we're doing is taking an evidence-based approach. We've, um, uh, James described the, the work that's underway uh, at the moment. Just to understand all of these issues, including business model innovation, design, but also opportunities across different sectors. So we just want to be clear where we think the greatest economic benefits are to Scotland. Uh, and then to, to pilot projects, um, hopefully they, they'll work, we can uh, refine them if not, and then scale them up to give the benefits that we're looking for. I think um, Graham Day had a question that relates to the work that you're doing just now, a yeah. practical point. Yeah, yeah if I may, I, uh, Zero Waste Scotland and uh, Scottish Enterprise are jointly managing a £3.8 million loan fund. I just wonder if you could give us examples of what sort of demand uh, that's attracting and um, perhaps examples of, of where investment is being made. I'm particularly interested in James Curran's point earlier on about the, the possibility of mining plastics from landfill sites, for example. Is there any sort of sign of somebody looking to do that? Perhaps Ian, I'm looking at Ian here, perhaps he would have uh, more, more current information. I mean, the, the, the loan fund was previously just focusing on plastics and then was relaunched at, the, I think, the beginning of this year to, to broaden it out to a much wider range of materials as well as remanufacturing. Um, I'm personally I'm not aware of uh, any awards which have been made under that fund, fund since it's been relaunched, uh, unless you've got any other information here. Yeah, to be fair, I, I don't think there's any, been any awards uh, since it was uh, launched at the beginning of the year. Or I think it was February time. Uh, we have a number of projects in, in the pipeline. Uh, we obviously still have some plastics uh, projects uh, in the pipeline as well. But yeah, there are a number of, obviously the expansion of that, getting that message out to businesses, there is a, there is a mechanism to support the shift to infrastructure or development of infrastructure and even business models is there. Uh, I guess this morning time is probably still a bit early to, to, to report on any successes, I guess, uh, within that, but there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, but yeah, there's a promotional piece for us and Scottish Enterprise to ensure that businesses understand that it's shifted away from plastic, so to speak. Uh, the question you asked about mining, uh, n we did a report last year, actually, so we've gotten to look at landfill mining uh, as it's technically called, uh, not just for plastics, but for a whole, a whole host of materials, particularly precious metals. Uh, you know, that idea that there's, there's more gold in our landfill than, than, you know, than we'd be able to think about in terms of the value. Uh, there is some issues around it, as, as all of you can probably imagine, uh, practically and socially as well, uh, in terms of uh, getting that stuff out. And unfortunately, the, the challenge, as you can imagine, uh, all of the, the, the precious materials are all scattered about the landfill. They're not, you know, so actually you, you end up with a lot of other stuff that you potentially isn't of value in the landfill or as, as of value in that landfill. So there is some challenges, but it is something that is certainly others uh, we're interested in looking at uh, from a Scottish perspective, but also across Europe uh, about the technology of how that might take forward. I, I don't think it's as practical at this moment in time uh, in terms of the cost. Uh, against the benefit, but yeah, I think as, as technology expands and the price of those materials goes up, uh, I think it's something that will be looked at again. Yeah. I take it when we're talking about a fund of 3.8 million, we're looking at some fairly small scale projects by and large that, that would be supported. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, for instance, the, you know, plastics, uh, you know, you could be looking at a facility of uh, 10, 20,000 tonnes of plastics. Uh, depends on the type, so that's off the scale. So we're not, yeah, I think we're, that's the kind of interventions that we're looking at in terms of the loan fund. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, that fund is specifically aimed at the work that we do, but more broadly, you know, Scottish Enterprise uh, have access to other funds uh, more considerable in terms of scale to support business develop development in Scotland. So we're trying to use this as a kind of bringing people to the table uh, and getting things started, but bigger prizes, I guess, there are other mechanisms within the Scottish uh, Enterprise uh, budget to support that going forward. So, If I may find we can be, uh, could you give us an indication of, of the interest you're getting so far as a good geographical spread across Scotland? The more you take account of some of the challenges that my colleague Dave Thompson had kind of highlighted in areas like the Highlands. To be honest, I, I'd have to come back with that. I don't, I mean, I know of the kind of number of types of projects, but I, I haven't. I haven't got the information about geographical trust. If you could, in any way, you know, help us with that. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the key things that obviously my team in conjunction with Scottish Enterprise is promoting the fund. It's not just about saying it's there uh, and sticking it on the website. So I know that we've been doing some work uh, with particularly Highland Islands Enterprise and the promotion of it as well uh, to ensure that you know 
businesses up there are aware of it. So, but I'll get back to you on the geographical. Okay. Well. I've got some governance issues to sort of come back to in a minute or two, uh, but I'd like to just now just bring in Ian Mingus and, uh, or is it Menzies? I can never remember. You can say Mingus is Mingus, yes. Yeah, okay, and Dustin, uh, Dustin Benton as well in this section. So Ian first. Just picking up into the skills agenda, because uh, it's something obviously that we've got a real role in, and Gordon mentioned the importance of the Wood Commission agenda in redeveloping Scotland's young workforce. So we think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities coming through, particularly in, in relation to sciences, technology, engineering and maths. We've now got a much more flexible approach to the senior phase in secondary school, so we could be looking at things like modern apprenticeships in the circular economy and, and so on for young people. So we think there are some real exciting opportunities. A much closer working between schools, and uh, colleges and universities, for instance. So, you know, young people are developing HNCs in some of these relevant areas before they leave uh, before they leave school. So, we think that's you know, real potential there. The other big challenge for us in terms of skills of teachers, because they obviously have responsibility for a future a future generation in developing these skills. And we know from uh, from all our evidence, uh, teachers across Scotland do need a lot of support, particularly in the primary sectors and other sectors. We're looking at building their confidence in terms of sciences, technology, engineering and maths. So through the, the partnership with the Elmer Carter Foundation, you know, we've reached out to about 64%, I think, of secondary schools in Scotland, engaged with about 700 teachers. But early discussions were very much about scaling up. And those are the, the challenges that we face as well when there's 51,000 teachers in Scotland. So, you know, we've been engaged in a lot of different uh, professional learning events for teachers. We've supported them. As I mentioned this week, we're really trying to establish us a practitioner network. One of the things we did early on in partnership with the Elmacarta Foundation is take a group of teachers on an international study visit to Ireland to see Deso Carpets that James had mentioned was doing some really world-leading uh, work in this area. So you know, we really need to think deeply about uh, the skills of teachers and how we build them. And I think one of the really exciting opportunities we've got just now, particularly with this Team Scotland approach and discussions we had around the table today, is that is a lot of this innovation emerges in Scotland. And we hear about these small companies all over Scotland and other companies engaging with Agenda, like Dryden as well, is that how can we provide opportunities for teachers to engage with those industries, to get in, to see what they're doing, for young people to get into the boardrooms, to share ideas as well. Because one of the premises of Curriculum for Excellence is about making learning relevant and it becomes relevant when young people get a chance to see it in their own doorstep, in their own area, and the impact it's having on their own communities. And I was really pleased to hear about the Scottish Lyle Group. I know they're doing really good work you know, but, uh, with schools and membership, but I suppose that's one of the big challenges, is how do we extend that, develop these partnerships so industry are, are really taking responsibility for ensuring the future generation and our teachers are developing the necessary skills. Hey, Dustin? Um, I just want to come back to this idea of built-in obsolescence, and I, I think that uh, we struck on something really important here when um, the, the comment was made, it goes against the grain to get rid of things. I think there's something quite important in here about what consumers want, thinking about the drivers behind some of the things that the circular economy might be able to do, and coming back, I guess, to the question, can, what can legislators do, slightly anticipating where we're likely to go. Um, I don't have a clear-cut policy recommendation here, but I think that it's useful for legislators to understand some of the reasons why businesses might be interested and to possibly enable some experimentation here. So what, thinking about mobile phones, Greenlines is running a project with Google on how we get more circular electronics devices, including mobiles. Consumers want certain things out of them. So they want things like battery time. They want them to look attractive. They want them to load web pages in a certain period of time. So why couldn't you design a business model, and there's really no reason why you couldn't, that gives you a phone for a, a fee or perhaps part of your network fee that guarantees you eight hours of talk time. It guarantees you web page loads within, I don't know, 10 seconds or something like that. And it enables enough modularity that you can change the way it looks to suit whatever fashion you, you, you choose. This is the sort of thing that is interesting to businesses because they think, okay, I can see how in a world where the mobile market is shifting from expensive devices, 600 pound iPhones, down to the latest one, the Moto E, which will sell for less than 100 pounds, how can I maintain value in this market? Because there's a sort of remorseless drive to cheap in, in these sorts of devices. We've seen it over the last, uh, the last decade. And manufacturers that are thinking, how 
how do I keep my profit margins on a device that's worth 100 quid versus a device that's worth 600? There's a real challenge there. But if I can sell a service and disconnect what's going on with the physical device from the service that I get you, that's an opportunity for value. Now, this is pretty radical stuff. I mean, nobody's really doing this at the moment. And that raises the question, how do we get this testing to happen? How do we enable Scotland, for example, and it might not be in mobile phones, it might be somewhere else, to be a test bed for these sorts of, uh, these sorts of activities? Part of it is about having the skills base to enable people to be in Scotland who can think of these sorts of things. There's also something here about um, you know, enabling experimentation, creating the institutions. I don't, as I said, I don't have an answer on what the policy to make this happen is, but I think it's important that when legislators think about the, inter the interactions, things that they can do, they're informed by, that, by this idea of future opportunity in a decoupled resource world. Well, it leads us on, I think, probably to thinking about you know, what should the role of the Scottish government be uh, you know, in the next few years in supporting the move to the circular economy. And one of the things that's been suggested is that, uh, and it was James Curran who mentioned this earlier, the fiscal and regulatory levers are something that government has, and procurement levers as well. Um, so what do you think uh, about that question? Because it seems to be you know, from us politicians' point of view, something that we can report upon as well as some of the details. But we have to have that governance uh, issue in mind. How do we, first of all, uh, engage in, in the role of actually leading towards a circular economy? Um, how do we track progress? How do we apply the levers? Or what levers should we apply? So, anyone want to kick off in that one? Ian? Uh, yeah, I mean, and another aspect of it from the government's point of view is, is, is leadership. Uh, you know, I think we all welcome that, that certainly the, not just the government, the cross party support for the zero waste ambitions of, of Scotland. I mean, that, that, has, that has writ large in terms of, uh, you know, sort of bringing people to the table, not just in Scotland, but across the UK and Europe. You know, people are very well aware of. of, of of that direction of travel. So there is a point about, you know, government saying circular economy, that's for us. And I think, you know, we're going in that direction. You're obviously, the Scottish Government have signed up to, as we've said, the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation C100. We're, we're the first country to be involved in that. Uh, so it's about demonstrating leadership as well. Uh, I think my bit I always come back to when I get asked this question is around procurement. I mean, there's obviously some of us around this table have been involved in the, the procurement bill that's going through Parliament uh, and, and looking at that uh, in terms of how that could shape uh, both resource efficiency and, and zero waste ambitions, but now circular economy, reuse, repair. And I think that's, that's the place for me that we could really uh, make a difference. How could we ensure that that bill uh, encourages, uh, facilitates uh, more smarter procurement so we can actually see some of the things we've talked about today different service types, leasing, lending, uh, repair, remanufacturing coming through the system because that will demonstrate, that will create a market for not just Scottish businesses but other businesses uh, across Europe to come to Scotland to, to sell their way or sell their new business models because uh, they'll see that this, this, is, this is a serious place to do business. And so it's how we can do that. Uh, and, and I think I go back to your point about piloting things. How do, how do we stimulate the innovation. So, yeah, there's things that we could we could do. I mean, my example, and I'm sorry to labour the point, I mean, people have heard me talk about it before, street lighting. Uh, we have a huge opportunity at the moment because uh, we're about to refurbish nearly all the street lights in Scotland over a set period of time uh, in conjunction with the local authorities. And that's really about, as we know, putting LED lights into all of the, you know, replacing the sulphur things and obviously having a huge economic saving in terms of the price of electricity. But that's an opportunity, a massive infrastructure project. There's recycling opportunities in the, in the stands that are coming down, the lamp stands that are coming down. What are we going to do with that material? What are the new materials, what are the new stands going to be made of in terms of uh, metals and alloys and, and stuff like that? But more fundamentally, it comes back to the point that Colin was making about business models. There's, and it's always, we always start mentioning companies, but Philips, are one of the companies who are now not just selling lamps and not just renting lamps, but they're selling light, Lux. That's what their business model, they want to move to a point that, you know, we don't actually want lamps, we actually want light and so much of it so we can see what we're doing. So they're now developing uh, a business model 
uh, around selling of lux. So is there an opportunity there within our refurbishment of streetlights in Scotland to pilot some of this thinking, you know, to, to get local authorities to, to carve out a bit of this, maybe not all of their, their infrastructure, to start saying how can we actually work with these companies to develop a new business model. Uh, and the other thing about that is it creates innovation, and that's the point you was making, the biz because actually if the if Phillips are selling the light at a, at a fixed cost to the local authority or to the, whoever, and then they start to work out they could actually do it cheaper if they start to innovate the, the infrastructure. They will do that. They will start to innovate. So it's not just having the thing for 15 years. They will constantly be innovating to make sure that you are getting the, the light that you want at a cheaper rate, uh, both for their point of view in terms of a business, but also for the customer. So there's real opportunities if we could use public procurement, uh, shaping the public procurement bill that enables this type of thinking across the piece. Marlon Wakefield, you know, you're in a position where you're, you've got an innovative process. How could the government help, you know, focus its attention for firms like you that are in the stage of developing something that's innovative like that? We've, we've always been very focused on R&D. Um, we've developed the AFM and we're looking at developing it further um, and targeting what we activate it with uh, so we can target certain minerals or arsenic taking out of the water but we need the raw materials and that's really important so we need to look at i mean edinburgh council at the moment separate their glass but um, i have heard they are going to mix it now that creates a problem we don't want mixed glass so it's vital that we look at how we collect the glass because there are only um six color sorters in the uk um we have to uh, there's not enough so we, we need the clean material. A lot of the um, remelt companies as well, they, they need the clear glass material. So it's important that we do. What's the point of mixing it when we collect it to buy a machine, which costs a fortune to then separate it all again? Um, for us to do that would cost a fortune um, for the company. It wouldn't be viable to put one of these colour sorting machines onto our, our company. So we're looking in ways of perhaps councils working together, we talked about the 32 councils, if they could formulate some sort of plan. Um, Dumfries and Galloway at the moment, they have a colour sorting machine and we have tendered for their glass. Um, if we get the tender, it will be um, 1,000 tonnes a year, which is going up to 10,000 tonnes, which is great, but it's not enough for us. We need other councils to get together and perhaps um, buy or collaborate together and formulate a way of, of collecting the glass of colour sorting the glass and it might be too expensive for one council but if a few councils get together they can share the resources um, it's a very interesting uh, you know point that's a good one for us thank you very yeah. much james Curran wanted to come in at the moment thank you um i think ian made some some very good good points earlier and if i can maybe just take that a, a little bit further I, I think it is sensible for us to use the tools that are already available to us as, as we said earlier before we we look at be, being more radical maybe in the future in terms of uh, legislation here in scotland uh, and being a regulator you would expect me to talk up the value of regulation but i think uh, one of the main values is it, of it is the interventions through uh, regulation can can stimulate very rapid change uh, and we know that uh, China, Japan and Germany ha have uh, actions in place to try and move them rapidly towards more circular economy. So, and as I said earlier, we are in such, such a, uh, an advantageous position in Scotland having uh, very significant amounts of renewable energy that I feel as though we should move as fast as we can towards a, a more circular economy. So what about the tools we have? Um, and those regulatory tools. First, the, 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 but we need to use those in a smart, clever way. Again, as we said earlier, we need a good evidence base in order to make those regulatory interventions. And those interventions should do, deliver multiple benefits. And from the business perspective, should stimulate creativi creativity and innovation, but also remove business risk. Uh, and if I can just give one tangible example, and I'm not, I'm not claiming this would be the right one, but just to give a feel for how it might be used. Um, I was in San Francisco recently, and they have a, a bylaw. They don't, that's not quite the right technical word, that any takeaway packaging needs to be uh, compostable immediately made me think, well, could we do something similar in Scotland and insist that all takeaway packaging in Scotland be uh, made of recycled material uh, and or compostable? 
and it so happens we do have an award-winning company in Scotland, I would imagine absolutely ready and I would imagine willing to supply that market. So using, as I say, Section 82 of the Climate Change Act, which is ready and waiting there, uh, we could easily uh, put that kind of regula regulation in place. Uh, it would stimulate other businesses, no doubt, to be creative, but we already have a business there that would uh, increase its market and increase its home market on which it can build to be more internationally competitive. Um, clever regulation could, uh, as I say, deliver multiple benefits. And uh, Colin Webster? Well, in, in, some, in some way, James has made some of the points I was going to make, so just very quickly, when, when we speak to legislators, uh, some of the key points that that we get across, number one, is, is that you need to understand thoroughly what the circular economy is. <clears throat> and that seems like a rather obvious point, but we have seen examples where, folk, where, where, where legislatures have rushed in, uh, perhaps a little bit too quickly. Second is that rushing to legislate uh, too quickly might be a mistake, but finding mechanisms to foster pilot projects to learn from is a good start. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, given what Ewan Mairns has said, that's, that's precisely what's going on through um, Scottish Enterprise. Thirdly, it's about listening to business partners and getting them on board, and, and obviously having Dryden and Aqua here today is a demonstration of, of the, the government's desire to do that. And finally, it's, it's carefully reviewing policy uh, review documents. Uh, and James referred to, uh, to China, to Japan, to Germany, and, and the directions that they're moving in, but also to, to go back to the, the resource efficiency, the European resource efficiency document that I referred to, because this is going to be seen, I think, as a driver for, for legislation in the circular economy across Europe. Yeah, that's uh, given us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, I think most of you have uh, had a, a good input to our thinking. Um, we're very keen to try and make sure that uh, we can uh, lead, we can track, we can you know, encourage uh, and we can use the levers that we have and the Climate Change Act obviously is one of our responsibilities in this committee and uh, you know, looking at that more carefully uh, would be really useful as well. So I think at this stage it would be a good idea that we stop the conversation at the moment. Uh, if there's other things that any of you wish to tell us in writing as a follow-up, that would be very welcome. Uh, and uh, in our deliberations, we'll be right into the minister in due course. I think my colleagues agree. And uh, that we'll try and, uh, and capture some of these things uh, just now. Uh, so working with the, the different parts of government already engaged, um, we've got to try and get the idea out there, talking about the circular economy. And obviously in the fields that you have uh, covered from business, through skills, through economic development, through research, we can see a clearer picture than when we come in this morning. So I'd like to thank you all for that. And uh, we'll end uh, this item of business just now. Um, just before we go um, and close the meeting, the next meeting of this committee is on the 21st of May, and we'll take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on single-use carrier bags. Um, uh, uh, instrument and uh, from the chair of the Scottish Government's Wild Fisheries Review. So I finish the meeting now. <coughs>